Imagine you were given the opportunity in absolute secrecy to press a button that would give you a million dollars. But as a consequence, it would also kill a random person somewhere on the other side of the world. You would never meet this person or witness his or her death, and it would be guaranteed that nobody would ever know what you had done or question the source of your money. Would you do it? It's easy to say no in theory, but given the actual opportunity, you'd probably at least falter before declining. And there's a good chance that deep down in your heart, you'd have to acknowledge that you might actually do it. But let's say the deal was changed just slightly. Let's say you still got a million dollars, and your act was still anonymous with no chance you'd be caught. The only difference would be that instead of pushing a button, you would walk into a stranger's house and shoot him between the eyes. Suddenly, this feels like a very different proposition, right? Yet, we all know that the two acts are essentially the same. There's no moral distinction between killing someone with a trigger and killing someone with a button. The only difference is that pressing the button is more palatable because it lets you separate yourself from the victim and the act. The point of the scenario is obvious. While we like to think we're decent people, we can tolerate surprising horrors as long as we have some distance from them. If we don't have to face up to the reality of an atrocity, the screams, the fear in the victim's eyes, the image of a violent act being carried out against a human being we actually have to see, then we can reduce it to a vague abstraction and be shockingly cold about rationalizing it. And I'm convinced that this, Christians, is the only reason you can tolerate Jehovah's cruelty. Assuming the Bible is true, your God's Old Testament victims are not only on the other side of the world, but thousands of years in the past. You never had to meet them, never had to recognize them as real people who love their families, who dealt with the same emotions and daily concerns that we deal with. Then you never, having gotten to know them as humans, had to watch them be slaughtered. Thus, you can shrink Jehovah's atrocities, for example, the deaths of every man, woman, and child in Jericho, to a distant concept and shove them to the back of your mind. You don't really think these actions are okay, you just kind of pretend they aren't there, and when forced to confront them, slap a neat explanation on them and try to keep ignoring them. Kind of like how you'd cope with killing by the push of a button. But what if, Christians, you had to pull the trigger instead? Let's do a thought experiment to test your faith. Imagine you're sitting in church, listening to a sermon, when your pastor tells you he's come upon an amazingly detailed biblical prophecy. It's so specific that it actually includes the names of your town and lists you, along with your pastor, other members of your congregation, and several of your neighbors, as being among that community's God-fearing righteous. Cool, huh? The prophecy then goes on to state that by July 15, 2016, the wickedness of a nearby town will have become so great that God can no longer tolerate it. In this prophecy, God goes on to command that on that date, you and all the other righteous men of your town drive over to the next town and destroy it, killing every man, woman, and child except for the teenage girls and unmarried women, which you are to keep for your own use. Shocked, you flip open the Bible and find the verse right there in black and white. And after church is dismissed, you run out and check other copies of the Bible, other translations. You even, for the sake of putting your mind at ease, dig out an old worn Bible from your youth and find that, yes, this prophecy had been there all along. You had just never come across it before in your previous readings. So this command was undoubtedly part of the Bible, and as such, the inerrant word of God. There would be no question that by following it, you would be obeying God, and by failing to follow it, you would be disobeying Him. If this were the case, then would you, on July 15th of the next year, load up your guns and ammo and join the convoy with all your obedient neighbors? Once you arrived, would you roll down your window and gun down a group of children playing in a park? Would you kick down the door of a house and shoot a man who's trying to shield his family while his wife screams and his children cry? Then put a bullet through his wife's head? Do the same to the baby she dropped on the floor? Would you chase their toddler into the other room and finish him off? And once the community had descended into chaos, would you fall back to help blockade all the roads out of town before moving in to mop up the streets, the public buildings, and finally the hospitals and nursing homes? And if you, over the course of this assault, found a girl hiding behind a desk in a high school classroom, would you drag her kicking and screaming into your car so that you could take her home and make her your wife? And as you did this, would you be able to rationalize your actions on the grounds that the town's wickedness had made it irredeemable, that the slaughter was necessary for the preservation of God's people, 
or that God simply knew what he was doing because he was God? Would you even be able to watch this carnage, trusting that it was all okay because God commanded it? Now, I can already hear the objections coming. I'm sure this will come off as a mean-spirited exaggeration. As a Christian, you might say, you don't have to speculate on your response to a made-up command that God never gave you. Fair enough. But this isn't really about anything as trivial as a made-up command. This is about making one of God's actual commands, a command that he issued over and over throughout the Old Testament, vivid and real to you so that you can confront whether you're actually okay with it. If you can't stomach the acts of biblical violence being carried out in a modern context, then you really don't approve of them. You just see them as fairy tales that you don't have to think too hard about. But there's no moral difference between Joshua killing everybody in Jericho 3,500 years ago and you killing everybody in the next suburban American town today. If you want to say that context, the people's wickedness, or God's holiness made it right back then, then you would have to be willing to step up and act if context, people's wickedness, or God's holiness made it right today. In other words, if you're willing to push the button, you also have to be willing to pull the trigger.